This is episode 17 of the Immunology Podcast, Innate Immune Receptors with Dr. Jenny Tink. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Rad. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today, we have Dr. Jenny Ting from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill on the podcast to talk about her research on a family of innate immune receptors called NLRs and their role in inflammation. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights of the immunology news coming up, but first... Stem Cell Technologies would like to introduce you to Immune Regulation News, a free weekly newsletter brought to you by the Stem Cell Science News Program, covering research on the regulation, suppression, and modulation of the immune system. Immune Regulation News keeps reader current with the latest news, research, policy, events, and jobs relevant to the immunology community. Subscribe for free at www.immuneregulationnews.com. Hi, Jason. Good afternoon to you. Hello, hello. How are you? Very well. Very well. Ready to discuss some science. But you know what? First, I just want to mention that over the weekend, I was reading like the nerd I am. I was reading a very interesting website. Maybe you already know about it. Uh, the New York Times COVID-19 vaccine tracker. Have you ever uh, looked at that webpage? I have been there. I prefer the Hopkins tracker, but yes. Yeah, no, no. But this is, they're talking about each of the uh, current uh, vaccine candidates in different phases. And they do a little kind of explanation, a little description of the ones that are the most promising or the most interesting. And there's a lot of very interesting stories uh, because they don't only talk about, you know, the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. They're talking about obscure vaccines that are only uh, approved in Turkmenistan, or they are talking about this Australian vaccine that's getting, is looking for funding for the phase one, two trials through a GoFundMe page. There are a couple of vaccines, two vaccines that are being developed on plant cells. So they, they want to be produced in plants more specifically plants of the family of the tobacco plants. And I'm not kidding. These two vaccines are funded by uh, the by Philip Morris and British American tobacco. So they are getting are you, into the vaccine. Are you going to smoke the vaccine? I mean, that would probably <laughs> yeah. not work very well. But Yeah, no, I think you, you, can, you can just produce the, the, the protein in the plants. So I think it's the adenoviral vector type. And then you can just like purify that from the, no, from the plants. I got it. I got it. You smoke it, but it's an IgA producing vaccine. So it's a booster from the from the guest we had on before with the IgA secretion. So you smoke oh. it, inhale it in your lungs. It activates in that tissue and then gives you a buzz while you get vaccinated for your IgA induction for COVID. There you go. Brilliant. There you go. I mean, it is the right mucosal surface you're targeting. So it might actually be something there. And what would you do like, with, with vaccines produced by insect cells? Yes, Sanuki and, J and JSK they're making. And then, and one more, one more example that was fascinating is there was this vaccine candidate from the University of Queensland. That was a huge issue with it because it started giving patients that got it false positive results for HIV tests. Imagine the, <laughs> the chaos that generated oh, no. turns out and this is why dear listeners you have to be very careful about every gene you select if it's good enough for research doesn't mean it's good enough for pro clinical production oh, they were please. using some gag uh, derived uh, peptide and that was cross-reacting with the hiv tests all right folks public service announcement uh fully sequence everything and cross-reference it before you go commercial. <laughs> so very interesting. And one more thing I want to say, especially for the people in Europe, the United States, where we're very kind of focused on the, the big, you know, the, the Pfizer, the Moderna, the AstraZeneca, the most produced vaccine at the moment and the highest projections are for the Sinopharm vaccine, which probably most of our listeners haven't heard of actually going to be produced 7 billion doses next year. And the four, so the second most vaccine is the Pfizer, which is only going to make about three to 4 billion. So this Chinese vaccine that has been widely spread in developing countries, completely, completely kind of over, overrides the production of all the other vaccines combined, basically. Doesn't it have bad efficacy? 
No, that's not the Sinovac. It's a Sinopharm. So they're different. Ah. There are several different. There's tons of different Chinese vaccines. There's tons of different uh, Russian vaccines. And which have many of them have been approved for emergency use without any phase three clinical trial results, particularly in Russia, including this one that was only fully approved in Turkmenistan and nowhere else, not even in Russia. Uh, so I just want to say to our listeners, it is a fascinating read because never in the story of human uh, medicine we have had the chance to compare the one disease that one everyone is doing, trying to like kind of target the same thing. Fascinating read, the New York Times COVID vaccine tracker. You should go and take a look. I will have to, I guess. Uh, so this is what you did. We had Halloween last weekend. You guys do Halloween? Well, of course, everyone has to nowadays with this, you know, globalized society. It is my, it is my son's birthday. He was an ender dragon from Minecraft. My daughter was Princess Peach. My wife was a ghost. And I was a witcher from the TV show Netflix. <laughs> I want to say what a family of nerds, but I completely endorse that. That's great, guys. Did you, did you go as a cytokine or a CAR T cell or something? Yeah, no, we just we just put on some some whatever we can find because we, of course, thought about it too late. So we got just some 80s um kind of 80s like a uh, track suit thing with just like okay. nothing to stop stop the original. 80s i was alive in all of the 80s and well, for it to I was be a not. halloween costume makes me feel old yes i i dressed up as your youth <laughs> anyway <laughs> oh, all right well with that i guess we're with that we move, okay? round up <laughs> it's a little less depressing uh, all right i don't i guess Mine are two relatively similar themes, so I'll start with one and then we'll hop over. Um, the first one is about replication stress responses. So this is in Science Translational Medicine. First author is Daniel McGrail. Last author is Shai Yin Lin. Um, and it's an interesting paper. It's entitled Replication Stress Response Deficits Are Associated with Response to Immune Checkpoint Blockade in Non-Hypermutated Cancers. So to take a step back, we found that like PD-1 inhibitors, immune checkpoint blockade inhibitors work, but they only work sometimes, but they have a really unique indication that they're, they're indicated not for a specific cancer now, but for all hypermutated cancers of certain types. So because they found that anything with that's hypermutated, um, so like instability island repeats as an example is one of the indications. This works on them. And so they're finding that there are certain trends in cancers that are independent of the disease, you know, so the specific organ that it's in, that that these PD-1, these checkpoint inhibitors work on. They're getting indications for that. So there's now a lot of work to try to figure out, well, in these other diseases, are there other predictors or classes that you can kind of go after that these work for that show a common theme? So it's very exciting as a general field because I think it really... Um, really does a lot for for treating people and so to to kind of take that a step further in this case what they did is they talked about a specific pathway of replication stress response so deficits so usually when a cell is having trouble replicating because there's a lot of dna damage like in cancer it has a stress response and then it dies because it says hey i can't grow and replicate right i am sad let me die but in some cancers that get you know more serious, that mutation goes away, or that 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 not the mutation that response goes away because there's deficits in the pathway. And so what they showed here is that deficits in that pathway, which are bad prognostic indicators of cancer in general, or a way for cancer to become more advanced, those lead to accumulation of uh, antigenic uh, DNA in a cell. So they prime cells to be immunogenic because they're building up all this DNA in your cytoplasm, which you should not have normally because they have replication deficits. And so they're not good at replicating, but they're not killing themselves. And so they accumulate this. And these, these cancers are responsive to PD-1 blockade. So they map this out. And without going into a ton of detail, but you should look at this paper. This is beautiful translational medicine. They map this out. They do it in, they take the signature. They do work in mice to show that it 
they validate it with mouse systems of disease, you know, adding and removing the gene with knockout mechanisms. And then what they really do to put the nail in the coffin is they go take all these public data sets of people who've been on PD-1 blockade uh, and who responded and who didn't and found out you can parse the responders and all these other large data sets where, oh, it didn't work for this tumor overall, or oh, it kind of worked here. The groups it worked in are all the ones that are um, this RSRD, so, you know, replication stress response deficit, have that uh, genotype pattern. So you can actually see the predicts response across multiple cancers types. So they went through and did breast cancer and renal cell cancer and looked at some other cancers in the paper, but they really showed straight up in seven tumor types, prostate, kidney, brain, in cohorts of patients that is predictive of response to PD-1. So it could actually lead to a new indication. And then they found adju adjuvant drugs, mind you, that could be used to induce this response or to make this deficit occur, to make more cancers responsive. All there's toxicity issues, and then it'd be a dual dosing, and that's another trial. It at least uh, is giving a path forward to adding it as a combo therapy as well. So kudos. I think it's a great paper that expands an ex indication of existing medication kind of in line with what we've been seeing in other ways for a PD-1 blockade, checkpoint blockade. And it gives a way to do a combo therapy to really open up the market more in terms of what these drugs work on. Very interesting. I have two questions for you. One is, does the uh, replication stress response defect correlate with a higher mutational burden of these tumors? And can you give me a couple of examples of which are the exact like, examples of genes that when they knock out are associated with the replication stress response defect? So, yeah, so it's not a hyper mutated. So they, they control for non hyper mutated deliberately. It's okay. just that if there's mutational burden that makes it so they have um, this problem. Now, let me see where the stress. So they the stress response profile was in a previous paper. Let me pull up the list. Um, so these are like CHK1 genes, CDC20. So CHK1 is a checkpoint gene. That's an example that they used here uh, in knockouts. Let me pull this because I don't memorize all the gene names. There's a bunch of them. Um, I think they use CCNA as another gene to input to 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 make this happen. CDKs as well. Mm -hmm. So cyclin dependent kinase. So there's a whole bunch of them. One, two, five, seven, nine, CCNA one, CCNA two. So it's all cell cycle dependent genes. Okay, they're all the checkpoints that allow the cell to continue in the cell cycle and, and replicate. But if they pick up mistakes or problems with the, with the genome, they will stop and the cell will stall and they we will die. Right. And in, this case, don't have this... in this case, it just keeps churning out the DNA because it loses that. All right. Um, and so they're not necessarily, so they control for more tumor, more mutations or more potential antigens, but that's, that doesn't seem to explain. It's just literally the, the 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 absence of this uh stress response that is seems to right. be right so what's concern. happening is the absence of the stress response program leads to accumulation of the dna in the cell right oh, you, 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 okay. you accumulate cyto you accumulate cytosolic dna and that is antigenic on top oh. of the one blockade all right okay abnormal. now i understand Okay, that's so very interesting. Cause cells to do, so A, you see they, they responds better, and if you can cause cells to do that, they start responding too. Okay. Well, I think that, that your paper, do you want to, should I continue with mine? Because it's kind of a nice segue into my own, uh, one of the papers I wanted to discuss today. So as I said, as it was, I think, quite uh, related to, to your uh, paper, because it also is talking about understanding resistance to checkpoint inhibition. And in this case, they're focusing on uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And this is a paper with six first authors, uh, was spearheaded by Samra Turacic and Sergio Quesada from uh, the Crick Institute and the University College London. They are part of this really, really cool, very large scale um, high clinical, so it's a, it's a mix of clinical, sorry, clinical trials and also studies that are looking into the uh, ev evolution of of tumors in patients. So part of them are called, this is a consortium called Tracer X Renal. They have Tracer X for different 
uh, types of cancer. And what they do is they follow uh, patients throughout treatment or throughout the progression of the disease. They take samples throughout time and they can really try to try with this information and with the samples, they can follow the immune response or the tumor evolution throughout the uh, progression of the disease or the response to treatment. So they, in this case, they are focusing on clear cell uh, renal carcinoma, which is the most common type, uh, subtype of kidney cancer. And what is interesting is that this, these tumors are usually not very uh, mutated. They don't have, they have fairly modest mutational burdens, uh, much lower than you see in, in metanoma or, or lung cancer, but still they seem to, some a part of them seem to respond to a checkpoint inhibition. And they also the one of the tumors that are the most highly infiltrated by T cells and particularly CD8 cells. So it seems to be often a very, uh, has a, a tumor that has a lot of immune cells there. Often these tumors are also enriched for frame shift insertions and deletions, which are sometimes a little bit harder to evaluate the effect on whatever antigens they might be producing because it's harder to a kind of uh, model than just simple um, single nucleotide uh, variants. And also these types of tumors are also characterized by a very high, a very high intratumor heterogeneity. And this all make kind of a very particular tumor type. So what they look in this paper are results from three clinical trials or three kind of uh, observational studies. This Tracer X, also the adapter clinical trial in which they're treating patients in a phase two trial with nivolumab, so an anti-PD-1 um, antibody and they're following the, 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 the response to treatment. And also what I think is very interesting, and I'm not a, I, I don't think a lot of groups really do it, but they are doing it a lot here, is their, their, their clinical trial uh, in which they look into autopsies of patients that are enrolled and they go very quickly and they collect material, fresh material from the patients that unfortunately didn't make it. But then they have access to all over a large amount of metastases, they can look and compare different metastatic sites. They can look into the infiltration of different places and they, have, they can take samples from patients throughout all of the metastatic sites, which is very valuable, I think. But uh, I remember them talking about these trials and how logistically difficult it is to, to get this to work because often patients die at very inconvenient times. So they look into the, this, the samples and they try to find uh, things that will explain the, those patients that respond. They have a group of responders and non-responders to uh, checkpoint inhibition treatment. Um, and they, in principle, again, don't find any association between the mutational, the mutational burden, the intratumular heterogeneity, and the response to the involuma. Uh, just as a disclaimer, this is uh, only 15 patients, so it's not a lot uh, to go with, but well, they, they really um, do a lot of, with the patients that they have to do a lot of analysis. And it's interesting also, there are some study cases within this, this, uh, within this uh, paper in which they, uh, in one of the patients, which they did a post-mortem analysis and they compare the different metastases. And they can find, for example, in this case, this patient had initially responded to treatment. He had a, a stage four disease who was quite advanced. And although it was initially responding in all sites, it had stable disease in all sites that were present at the moment of treatment, it started pro he started progressing in the brain and it ended up dying 27 months after treatment. And what it was very interesting is that this patient had actually a very, very high tumor mutation burden in the non-responsive metastasis, including the one in the brain. And they show that he had an inactivation of MLH1, MLH1 which uh, resulted in defective uh, mismatch, uh, DNA mismatch repair. But then what on top of that, these tumor cells had a mutation of beta 2 m which prevented antigen presentation. And that was a very clear example of a mechanism for checkpoint uh, for immune resistance that this tumor, despite having a very high amount of, of mutations, it escaped by losing beta 2 m And it was only the case of a couple of metastases that ended up uh, taking the life of the patient. Um, another thing that they look, which I think was very, very valuable is 
there's a group of potential antigens that have been identified previously, which are known as human endogenous retroviral uh, sequences or retroviruses, which are sequences that are kind of encoded cryptically throughout the, 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 their vestiges of uh, retroviruses that are found in the genome, and they can be expressed in upon uh, tumoral, uh, in certain tumors, they start expressing this, this, uh, this proteins that are uh, retroviral derived because of their dysregulation of these cells. And there had been previous studies that suggested that were a couple of specific retroviral sequences that seem to be expressed in renal carcinoma, and that were actually mediating T cell immunity, and they were activating the T cell immune response. And I thought it was very interesting because most of the previous studies have been done looking at the expression of these of these proteins on full, like kind of uh, the whole the whole tumor sample, uh, including tumor cells and the very highly, often very highly infiltrating immune cells. And in this case, they did they evaluated immune cells and tumor cells separately, and they showed that for many of these retroviral uh, sequences that they were identified previously, they were actually not expressed. They don't see expression in the tumor cells, they see expression in the immune cells. And then it makes sense that the expression of these particular virus sequences re relates to a better prognosis because often it might, a more mundane explanation might be that actually it's because it's more highly infiltrated with, with, with immune cells, particularly the main, particularly uh, neutrophils in one of the cases. And also there are other ones that have an uh, opposite correlation, which are also could be associated with immune cells that are not beneficial for the, for the anti-tumor response. When they look into the T cells, they start to try to look what are the, 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 the differences between responders and non-responders to nivolumab treatment. And they see that unsurprisingly, maybe T cells in responders have higher expression of activation of, of uh, uh, CD, uh, CD8, granzyme B, CD3 expression, the cells are more kind of activated. And they also express more TCF7, which is associated with a better kind of fitness of the cells, more cap capacity to uh, maintain long-term uh, populations. And they, um, they also see that uh, they can find immune heterogeneity between different sites and different metastases in the same patient. So it was very interesting, a very, I think it was a, a very uh, large effort. And the fact that they have several patients in which they could really look into different sites and also look uh, after uh, postmortem was very interesting. And, and one more thing that they looked at is also what I, I, I don't think I've seen before is they take, they pick up patients that were had a nephrectomy, uh, nef nephrectomy, so they had their kidneys removed right after treatment and what they and then they pick up they look for cells that are which are being bound by nivolumab so they really find the responder cells to nivolumab and they characterize these cells and compare them to the ones that are kind of they're not bound to nivolumab so for that they use uh, an anti igg4 which is the uh, the the constant chain of nivolumab and they do see that these cells that are bound by nivolumab express more uh, so of certain markers, particularly granzyme B, TCF7, CD39, TOX, PD, and uh, also unbound PD1, which suggests that they upregulate PD1 after treatment. So once the, the, the nivolumab already bound their targets. And they also detected more, for example, more T-Rex in the nivolumab positive cells in the non-responders, which I think is very interesting. I always think about what about the T-Rex they're expressing PD1 they're also being bound by nivolumab and they also seem to be activated and that may, might, might be detrimental for the immune response. So in general, they do have a very nice characterization and I think it's a really nice read to see what are the kinds of studies that are being done now to really to try to look at the details of the response that you can only look if you have this patient would you take samples throughout treatment, if you take many different samples and if you have access to uh, autopsies from the patients. So it sounds like it doesn't really lead new mechanistic understanding so much as it really opened up new hypotheses or avenues in terms of a an, an big tour de force of description, which is actually important. I think sometimes we underestimate that its importance, but it sounds like this one was really one of those 
you know, deep dives into patients, which is which is nice to see, and it's glad people are doing it. In a way, it's good people are getting in in good journals for that too. And yeah, so, yeah. So this was on cancer cell. So to kind of continue that, uh, a descriptive type of paper that I kind of have a mixed feelings about. This is an immunity. It's titled DNA methylation signatures reveal that distinct combinations and transcription factors specify immune in human immune cell epigenetic identity. First authors, first author is Rashi Roy. Last author is Rajan Sen. It's an immunity, as I said. I kind of have mixed feelings on this one. Right, so this is really an epigenetic mapping of cell fate. So think single cell RNA seq, but also with all the epigenetic mapping and showing that the methylation signatures of the genetic mapping demonstrate that there's different combinations of transcription factors that determine an immune cell's identity. So we kind of know this, right? We kind of know that everyone has the same DNA. That's all about expression. And we know that expression is controlled in some ways. Some of that is, you know, some of the, some of the expression is controlled by epigenetic changes, which permanently make some DNA more or less available. And that then those are the transcription factors. And that's how you get a cell fate since all cells have the same DNA. Okay. Um, so they do a lot of work to show this. It's not saying it's not a lot of work. It's a ton of work how they did this because they had to flow sort out the cells and then the epigenetic different cells. So you did your B cells and your T cells and your NK cells and your monocytes, granulocytes. And then they did all this epigenetic mapping, a lot of work. And then, so then, but then you could see they tried to get some mechanism there because they knew it couldn't stop. And so I think they get there somewhat, but it also for me kind of was just a little, like it's a really important work to do but is this really at the level of immunity? I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm not an epigenetic nerd and I don't realize just how bad, hard this is to do. And maybe that's why it got where it did. I think it's important, right? And having this knowledge is really important types of things, even if it's not, you know, groundbreaking paradigm shifting work. But it also, in this case, I don't know, it just kind of left me lacking. So the couple other findings they had is there's a specific transcription factor, EBF1. Binding of that coincides with DNA hypomethylated sites in human B cells. They can say that this, this transcription factor goes with hypomethylated sites. But though I thought was most interesting was they found that there was a difference between hypomethylation and hypermethylation between cell types, the what turns them on and turns them off. So it wasn't just that, let's say, you had more hypermethylation in B cells and T cells and less hypermethylation in uh, monocytes. You had completely different patterns. And that I think was really interesting. What they found here, and I got, I got, I'm trying to say this right, so I'm looking it up so I don't screw this up. So here it is: 80 to 90 percent of genes that were selectively underexpressed in B cells and T lymphocytes, so B and T cells, were hypermethylated, hypermethylated in their promoters or intergenetic reasons compared to other cell types, where only 20 to 30 percent of those that were selectively repressed were similarly marked. So B cells and T cells use more hypermethylation to suppress genes than other cell types. And that DNA hypermethylation is less important for establishing innate cell-specific gene silencing compared to lymphocytes. That I thought was really cool. So you see patterns, not just in methylation, that correspond to what we already know about cell fate decision, right? So, you know, everything comes from a white cell, but eventually you go down the two paths, right? From the hematopoietic stem cell down to monocytes and lymphocytes. Right. And so they show that that fork, right, that myeloid lymphoid fork has differences in methylation patterns. And, and methylation silence is using much more in B cells and T cells than it is in myeloid cells. I thought that and, and other lineages, too. I thought that was really cool. And that and that's what made me excited about this paper in the end, which is like, OK, now this is more interesting. But, you know, when they were initially going like, hey, look, they have different patterns based on cell type. You'd be like, yeah, they kind of have to, given what we know in biology. But the fact that they found this pattern that was very like cell type preference for silencing, mechanism of silencing, and there's mechanistic differences. It's not just that, you know, myeloid cells silence these genes and lymphocytes silence these genes, but how they do it is very interestingly different. And that's what I got here. 
So I thought I thought that was really cool and an important insight uh, down the stream. I guess my my question is why why do lymphocytes choose like methylation as their silencer of choice more than others? That is a great question. I don't they don't get there. They, yeah, they didn't figure out if it's like a mechanistic thing based on metabolism, if there's some other gene upstream that causes this. They don't get that far. But it's fascinating to see that that that, that there is this preference. In, in silencing mechanism. Are, are like naive lymphocytes more repressed than innate cells? I don't think so. It's just that what is repressed is done by hypermethylation. Or they didn't measure total repression of genes, at least in this. Okay. It's how they do it is different, which I think is interesting. And what is the what is what are most of the repression uh, mechanisms oh. in innate cells? Do they talk about it's that? Just, it's a mix. It's okay. much more heterogeneous. Okay. There's not a. So what do they have? Methylation. They have hyper the and hypomethylation acetylation. Mm -hmm. This is most of the, acetylation and stuff. This is okay. most of looking at methylation in the study. Right, because of the methylation, it's done in this case is on the DNA. the DNA itself. Right. Oh, oh, and the hazardization is usually on the histones. Right. So those are f fundamentally different. Uh, yep. Well, and you could okay. also use hypomethylation, right? This is hypermethylation. Yeah. Hypomethylation also on, on the DNA. Correct. All right. Interesting. So, so it is, is it a yes for those interested in, in, in learning more about, or is it a no, it's, it's just too complicated for the for the mortals of amongst I us. Think, I don't know. I think it's interesting. I also am not an epigenetic expert, so I don't know how field breaking this is other than I think it's really cool that there's pattern differences. So to finish up, uh, I'm bringing the mandatory COVID paper of today. Um, this is, it's not a terribly complicated paper, so it's, it's going to be a quick uh, chat, but I think it was very nice and it was a little bit out of my... Um, comfort zone. So this paper uh, was published in Science, first authors Yun Sang and Tian Shu Yao from the lab of Bing Chen at Harvard Medical School. And in this paper, they're looking into trying to understand characteristics of the spike proteins of the different Delta, of the different SARS-CoV-2 variants that would help explain their differential kind of fitness or the spread in the human population. And of course, they're focusing on the Delta variant, which is now, I think, almost everywhere, the, um, the majority of new infections is being done with the Delta variant. And so it was very cool because it kind of forced me a little bit to focus more on what is the role of the spike protein and what are the different parts of the spike protein that mediate the entry of the virus in the cell. And for this, I, I want to give a shout out to a really cool, really short review from Bing Chen and other authors uh, in Nature, in which they give a really nice overview of what we know about the spike protein and how it mediates fusion into cells. So we're, we can add the link also in the show notes for those interested in a very, like a couple of pages. Uh, but it was very good as a, a start, as, as a kind of primer for this paper. So we know that Delta seems to be very efficient at infecting people and have a shorter incubation period. And patients usually have a higher viral load when they get tested in comparison with earlier variants, particularly, of course, the Wuhan, original Wuhan variant. And so one of the things that could be this could be uh, caused by is the characteristics of the spike protein, which of course is this protein that it has on the surface of the virus that mediates binding to their target receptor, which is ACE2 on, on, the, on the host cells and mediates the fusion of the membrane from the virus with the membrane of the cell. Uh, usually the S protein is produced as a single chain precursor when this virus is being, the variants are being produced on the, on an infected cell. And then it's processed by a host protease, a furin like protease that cuts a, uh, a fusion, uh, uh, um, cleavage site that separates the S protein into fragments S1 and S2. 
And then S1 usually, uh, S1 contains the domains I think most people have heard of, the N-terminal domain, the receptor binding domain, some C-terminal domains, and then the uh, S2 fragment is actually the most important when it comes to mediating the binding, the, 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 the bringing together this, the, the surface of the, of the membranes to mediate fusion. So S1 binds to the receptor, stabilizes the connection, and then it kind of uh, gets uh, un, undone. It, can be, it, it separates from S2, and S2 is the actual the one that undergoes a very dramatic change. It binds to the membrane of the cell, and then it pushes or pulls together the two membranes, the virus and the cell, and that boom, you get virus coming in. So when you look at the, at the, at the sequence of uh, all the variants compared with the uh, original strain, and in particular, the case of the Delta variant, there are several mutations that happens, many of them on the N-terminal domain, some of them on the receptor binding domain. And there's also a one a mutation that was identified close to the cleavage site or the furin cleavage site that also was kind of of interest for scientists thinking, well, maybe these mutations are mediating better cutting, they're mediating uh, escape from the immune surveillance or mediating better binding to the receptor. So the, what they do is they start looking into comparing side by side all the different variants. And they do, for example, cell-to-cell -cell fusion assays in which they express the receptor ACE2 and the different S uh, spike proteins on hex cells. They mediate and they see how quickly and how efficiently they fuse cells together. And what they see is that at high expression levels of ACE2, may, most spike proteins uh, behave similarly, uh, and also uh, delta. But the, there's a very strong difference when ACE2 expression starts to reduce, uh, decreasing. Delta starts really up, uh, outperforming all of the others. So it can mediate very quick and very effective cell to cell fusion to the point that what they consider their negative control, which is hex cells not overexpressing H2, is enough. So the little endogenous expression is enough for delta spike to mediate cell fusion. So very efficient and something that really, really separates it from the others. When it comes to the kind of the maturation of the S protein, this, this, this cut that it's performed by the producing virus producing cell, this uh, doesn't seem to be the case that this mutation close to the cleavage site has any effect. So they kind of don't think that is a advantage of uh, the, the Delta variant. And also they don't see significant increased affinity of the binding to the receptor to the ACE2 receptor. So they also don't, they, they see that it's already quite efficient and also the, the, the cleavage is quite efficient. So it doesn't seem like Delta is really improving much on that. But what they do see is that the overall structure, the overall stability of the S protein, the two, the S1 and the S2, which are non, non longer covalently bound, it is much higher for the Delta. So Delta spike seems to be capable of being more stable than other, other ones, and that can be part of the reason why it's more efficient. They do very nice cryo-AM structures, and they show that, um, they, they conclude that the residues, they see differences in the, in the, in the uh, receptor binding domain. They don't actually mediate receptor to ACE2, so they're not contacting, they're not part of the surface that contacts ACE2. So it's probably also not affecting receptor binding, which is, makes sense with their, their experimental results. And so in general, what they see, they only see uh, the things that really characterize and, and separate Delta from the others is this capacity of fusing cells more, of fusing the, the, the cells more efficiently. And also the fact that although it has a couple of, uh, it does have a couple of mutations in, in the in terminal domain that prevent the binding of certain selected antibodies that are found and antibody responses from, from patients. So they also think that this, this, this virus has found a couple of mutations that allow it to uh, circumvent some of the immune response that people have generated against the original spike or against the original infection with the original version of SARS-CoV-2. So it's a very nice, very cool paper to understand how people are looking into these things. How do you understand the efficiency of this or the, the, how these uh, different variants uh, perform? So it was a kudos to the group. It was a very, very cool thing to read.
So when you say the Delta's real power is making it more stable, right? Because it doesn't change the entry interaction. What do you mean by stable? Like the on off rate of it? That's no, the actual. So the actual, when you have, um, they, they do some biochemical assays in which they, they express the, the, the spike protein kind of as a free, free, um, protein and they bind those. So they pick it up with a, with a tag and they show that this protein has a, a lower, uh, t tendency to separate so that, that the, because you end up having, so is spike, I think I didn't mention spike is trimers, right? Okay. So in the end, a full blown spike receptor protein is made of six different peptide uh, fragments that are all bound together. You have three times the S1 and three times the S2 in the middle. So if S1, if S1 starts kind of separating and you don't have the full spike, which can happen uh, if the, the connection is, if the, if, the, if the whole structure is not very stable, then so it's the not going to pr properly bind to ACE2 okay. when he finds the, the quaternary the structure cell. stability. Yeah, exactly. I'm a biochemist. You could... Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I need to, I have to look into my, my lexicon. I sometimes I, you know, it's not my, English is not my native language. That's why. Leninger's principles. You can, you can add that to your weekend reading. <laughs> oh, yeah. Gosh, that's a thick book, isn't it? it, it it's, it's, it's a very thick book. Yeah. But that's okay. Well, Leninger's is for later, but uh, Jenny Ting is up next, and we're going to be talking to her in just a few moments, uh, hailing from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. But first, ensure reliable results with your immunology research from primary human cells to cell isolation kits, cell media, supplements, and antibodies. Stem cell technologies provides the tools you need for every step of your immunology research. Interested in cell isolation? Use EasyCEP to isolate highly purified immune cells from virtually any sample source in as little as eight minutes. Cells are viable, functional, and immediately ready for your, your downstream applications. Learn more at EasyCEP.com. Joining us today is Dr. Jenny Ting. She is Professor of Genetics at the Lineberg Comprehensive Cancer Center at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And she was the former president of the American Association of Immunologists until, until early this year. The Ting Lab has made excellent contributions in many fields of immunology, particularly in innate, innate immunity and inflammation, including seminal work identifying the NLR family of innate immune receptors. Professor Ting, thank you so much for joining us today. You're very welcome, Brenda and Jason. So before we dive into kind of your, your larger body of work, which is very impressive and I think worth a lot of discussion, uh, you know, the podcast often discusses you know, life in the day of a scientist now as well, and kind of appreciating that. So how would you say, you know, scientists have to be adaptable? How have you guys adapted to, you know, lockdown, pre-pandemic, pandemic, pseudo post-pandemic, and doing the research that you're still putting out? I mean, we have new nature papers coming out now. Um, you know, that meant you were doing resubmissions, presumably during the pandemic. So how does, uh, how do you do that and do it well? Yeah, I just have to really give credit to the people who kept on working despite everything. It was really difficult. So we have a, like you say, the, the transition phase from March, 2020 to June, 2020, where we're all asked to stay home. Uh, we had some exceptions of people trying to resubmit papers. So they did all the horrendous revision during this time. And God, like you said, science papers out, nature papers out. May, may, science paper, I should say, nature and nature immunology. So they, they were just amazing in terms of persisting through everything. And I give full credit to the authors, especially the first author or shared first authors on these papers, including people from other labs. I started going back to the lab pretty much full time when they allowed us to starting in June of 2020. I just find myself unable to really focus and feeling like I'm not connecting to anybody uh, and finding it really frustrating to push things forward. And when I'm in the office, I actually feel like I'm con better connected um, and can take care of problems and making sure everybody's okay. Uh, as you know, there's a ton of mental strain, especially on young people, because this is a brand new experience for all of us. But those of us who are older have 
a lot of life experience to go back to and say, you know, maybe this will be okay. But I know for the young people, such as you guys, you know, it's really, really tough because this is not something we've ever seen since the last flu epidemic, right? So it's it's very, very difficult. But we're pretty much almost back to normal now in terms of the lab, everybody's vaccinated and uh, we're pushing things forward, like I said. So kind of going into that then in the work, uh, before we go to your most recent things, I think, you know, when I think of your work, I think of NLRPs, I think of NOD, NOD2 in particular, but that's because of my GI bias and the crosstalk that was occurring yes. at U UNC at then. So uh, for people who may not remember all the acronyms or what NLRPs and NODs are, could you give like a high level overview of how you got into this area and then kind of- Yeah, what, what... so we came to it by accident almost. Uh, we were working on an entirely different protein that is a master transcription regulator. Uh, called C2TA, so it regulates all MHC class two genes. And two people in my lab, uh, Jonathan Harton and Mike Lindhoff, were just searching the, remember this is pre-genomics days, you know, before the human genome was published. They were just blast searching the human genome and came up with 20 some human genes that looked like C2TA and we were just amazed. And they made the connection that these are also found in plants. And lucky for us, Jeff Dangle is actually at UNC as you know, and he's the plant disease resistant, you know, our gene guru. So we realized that we came upon this large family of proteins and that they all have shared domains. And so that's how we got started. And then many other labs uh, simultaneously were working on other members, you know, single members of this family discovered they were linked to uh, human diseases that are arthritic in origin. Of course, the NOT1, NOT2 uh, groups have discovered that these are linked to Crohn's disease and human genetics. So it's just exploded. So initially we called these the Caterpillar gene family and that was the first paper actually describing the entire gene family. And of course it has gone through uh, reiterations of renaming as NLR proteins, standing for MBDLR containing proteins. And we use that because that's what plant people call their proteins. So, so plant biology led to fundamental understandings of, of human, and I guess mammalian immunology. Could you briefly describe what these proteins do for those who don't know and aren't quite as nerdy on it? Yeah. So it's a, it's a family that seemed to have lots of different functions. Um, like I said, we started with the transcription factor. So you wouldn't think of that as being important for innate immunity. You know, the transcription factor is C2TA regulates, goes to the promoter, and we've studied this extensively. It was discovered by Victor Steinle. It goes to the class 3 MHC promoter, coordinates the whole promoter, causes gene expression. Another member of this family is called NRC5. It regulates class one MHC. So it's pretty phenomenal that two of these proteins, one regulates class one, one regulates class two, which really covers, you know, all of T cell activation when you think about it, right? CB4, CB8, et cetera. So those are the two and they kind of sit by themselves. Then you have this large family of subclass of uh, NLRs that are inflammasome proteins. An inflammasome protein is this protein group that sends a lot of um, what we call pathogen associated molecular patterns called PAMPs or DAMPs from damaged associated molecular patterns. And these then assemble into a large complex to make IL-1 beta, IL-18. All of these are uh, cytokines, critical cytokines. And then they also cause cell death. So this becomes a very important group. We also studied several of these NLRs that look like they actually reduce um, activation. So in many systems, in parallel, I'm sure that this is an immunology group, people will know that in T cells, you have co-receptors, right? You have uh, CD28s, for example, that are uh, activating receptors. Then you have all these checkpoint inhibitors that were now uh, targeting that PDL1, CTLA4, they're inhibitory 
proteins. So within the NLR family, we also find inhibitory proteins, just like CD28 and PDL1 as one is opposed to the other. We also found these inhibitory NLRs as well. So it's a very large family, lots of different functions. Um, like I say, cytokine production, transcription activation, cell death responses. And since the time where you first described this, these receptors, and, and so you just mentioned that they're not only necessarily uh, found in innate cells, what do you think has been the, the evolution of the understanding of these receptors and the different and in different parts of innate or molecule, um, metabolite single, uh, sensing or molecule sensing, for example, the, the found, when other molecules similar were found, such as sting, it's sting pathway, or how do you think this has the understanding of this type of receptors has evolved since the time they were first described? So I think you're asking a very large question, which is sting is not in this family. It's an entirely different group of mm -hmm. proteins that are critical for sensing nucleic acid, although some of the NLRs are also sense nucleic acid, and there's mm -hmm. more and more data indicating that. So we're, you know, going really up, looking at the big, big scale. Uh, these are all innate immune receptors, and uh, we know about main brain receptors, such as toll-like receptors or C-type lectin receptors. Those are your typical main brain receptors, right? They're on the outside, they're protecting the cells, they're sensing all these uh, pathogens in the milieu. And But what's really amazing in the innate immune system is there's so many receptors that are, are in the cytosol, and some of these are in the nucleus. And they're there to sense all sorts of perturbation, whether it's from pathogens, bacteria, viruses, fungus, et cetera or just perturbation from the cell. When the cell is unhappy, they're going through stress, they're destroying their mitochondria, mitochondria DNA are released. So they sense all sorts of perturbation of the cell and then they have responses. Um, so that's one thing that's really interesting. And the other thing is we found some of these are negative regulators. So you don't want cells to go haywire every day, like they're in a frenzy all the time. So you wanna actually turn down some of this. So that's another group of NLRs that we found that actually turns down, uh, you know, hyperactivation. So speaking of that, that's part of your work with AIM-2 and Tregs that came out in Nature of this year, right? With yes, yeah. So I don't know if you could speak to that a little bit. So I thought this was really interesting, with especially with EAE, where you were kind of getting a paradoxical reaction with the same amount of cytokines being produced, and then yes. all of a yes. sudden less injury. Um, yeah, so we're really excited about uh, linkage. So this, you know, it, m most people think about innate immune receptors, you know, by definition, they're on innate immune cells, right? So when you think about innate immune cells, you think about myeloid cells, macrophages, neutrophils, dendritic cells. And what we found is when we start start to look at either NLRs or AIM-2, which is, is not an NLR, AIM-2 is one of the very critical uh, DNA sensor that activates the inflammasome. And we start looking at these genes, there are some of them, not all of them, uh, are expressed highly in adaptive immune cells. So trying to figure out what they do would be, to me, a major challenge, especially since we're not T-cell people. So we really have to learn a lot of new, new tricks. And we're so lucky to have wonderful collaborators like Isam Wang and um, Li Shan Su at our institute and uh, Jason Whitmire, who have all helped us in the collaboration. So, in name two, what we found is that it's actually highly expressed by different T cell populations, including regulatory T cells. And it's really important in regulatory T cells to maintain an immune meta metabolic profile that's consistent with T regulatory cells. So, AIM2 has a different function in T cells that we were able to define. But in uh, myeloid cells, AIM2 is really critical for inflammasome, and there's really no question that that is the case. So we have to start having an open mind in terms of what these genes are doing in T cells and you know, B cells, different populations and so forth. So I just feel like that's an entirely new field that um, 
is really exciting and not too many people are doing that. Before, Brian, is, oh, sorry, Brian, I was going to jump in before you go next on your question. I know you had, I just have to ask this as a pause because you said you're not T cell people. So, Brenda and I always discuss what our favorite immune cell is. Uh, Brenda, which T cell is your favorite currently? I mean, regulatory T cells, of course. All right. <laughs> and, and, and Jenny, what is your favorite immune cell? I just have to ask. We're, we're starting to poll our guests. Oh, favorite immune cells. I love macrophages. <laughs> so, so I like something similar to a macrophage, which is an enterocyte. And I insist that it's an immune yeah. cell and prove me wrong uh, is my uh, joke here. But I, I had to pause on the, before the deep dive to, to get the poll in here. All right. So we have one macrophage, <laughs> one enterocyte and one T-reg. <laughs> I think we study, you know, well, I just find macrophages to be pretty amazing. All the functions that it can mediate you know, including activating T cells. But like I say, we hop into the adaptive immune field with some trepidation, but we, I always feel like science will lead you, that science will tell you what you need to do. And when they tell us what to do, we will find collaborators who can help us. And I've learned an awful lot by having wonderful collaborators. But my lab, you know, to be honest, the lab is the wisdom of the collective wisdom, right? It's not me. It's our collective wisdom. And we certainly have people who have great expertise in adaptive immune cells. So they were able to carry on the project, um, you know, together with collaborators. That's a great team spirit you're describing right there. Um, and I'm glad that the path is taking you to the T-cells. And on that on that note, um, I just want to say that when I think of macrophages, I think of like some crazy cookie monster just going there eating everything. But well, besides, that's totally beside the point. I also want to, I was very impressed by other paper that you, for not being T-cell people, you have another very interesting paper uh, involving T-cells and CD4 T-cells. And actually one of the NLR, NLR receptor uh, giving so inter interfering or uh, influencing HIV um, infection in T cells. I think that was also quite fascinating. And not only are you going to T cells, you're going into kind of immunometabolism, multi-omic analysis. That's very, very, very cool uh, stuff. So maybe would you also like to briefly tell our uh, listeners what have you been looking on that area? Yeah, that's again, you know, like I say, it's the collective wisdom, right? So the T Red paper was led by uh, Emily Chow and our collaborator, Jang Li Guo and uh, Yi Song Wang. And this other paper is really directed by a research assistant professor in the lab, Hai Tao Guo, who's an HIV person. So I can, he always wanted to do HIV. So that's what he wanted to do. And I couldn't convince him to like not do that. So. <laughs> Uh, I just have to like say, okay, you do what you like. And this is the field that he's chosen. And uh, I give full credit really to Hightower. So he was the one who looked at this protein that we discovered years ago called NLRX1. And he and others have published papers showing NLRX1 promotes HIV replication. You know, it, it, when it's there, you can have increased HIV load. But we never really looked at its role in T cells because, again, when you think about innate immune receptors, you don't think about T cells. But he showed that it's well expressed by T cells and just went on and did the whole study showing that what NLRX1 does in T cells, in CD4 T cells, is it promote, is there, when it's there, it promotes HIV replication. And this is done because it promotes an um, immune metabolic pathway that's favorable for HIV replication. So um, it increases oxidative phosphorylation. And if we just use common FDA approved drugs that can reduce Oxfox, um, we can reduce HIV load, viral load. And we did this in uh, humanized HIV uh, infected mice with lesion. And in addition to that, we also looked at uh, patient, you know, patient-derived HIV uh, viruses and showed that this really happens with genuine virus you isolate from clinical isolates. And then we looked at, uh, together with our collaborators at Case Western, 
uh, from uh, Ralph Blake Pierre's colleagues lab, we were looking at patients from East, uh, from Africa and from Asia and found that those with high viral load actually have higher signatures of oxidative phosphorylation. So it's kind of the first link that we can link NRX1, this protein, to oxfos, to HIV, to trying to reduce this pathway. And of course, as you know, in HIV uh, infection, uh, the, uh, there's established medication and established treatments, but there are also resistance. So we think that this may be a way to even increase uh, efficacy of drugs, because if you can use it together for exist with existing treatments or treat people who are, become resistant, that may be one way of looking at it. And so all we did is use metformin, which is a type 2 diabetes drug that's FDA approved. And so that's just proof of principle, but indicating that you can potentially use other uh, targets of OXFAS. So to kind of go down this line a little bit, but more generally, how much is understood about NLRPs in terms of immunometabolism or metabolism generally in terms of regulating? Yeah, yeah certainly there's uh, really beautiful work done in uh, um, the inflammasome in RP3, for example, by Luke O'Neill's lab and others, you know, looking at how NRP3 can affect uh, immune metabolism. So that's been done in other labs. Um, there's a few, we have looked at uh, other NLRs such as NRC3 that we found also to be regulating uh, immune metabolism. They're changing, therefore changing CD4 functions. Um, you know, this NLRX1 is another one. Uh, there's a few, and other people have, uh, there's a lot of studies done on CGAS sting pathway and immune metabolism. So that's another area that, that has extensive work done. So I think there's going to be really exciting connections between these genes, how they affect immune metabolism, and how that affects effector population, whether it's innate immune cells or T cells or B cells. And I guess my other real quick follow-up is, I know these proteins also regulate pyroptosis. And uh, from my time at Penn and some work I did, I got involved with gastrodermin. I don't know if you guys looked at gastrodermin at all, because I've started to see that it regulates not also the pores, but has other uh, side, I don't want to say side effects, but other effects as well outside of just, you know, the pyroptosis pore formation. I don't know if you guys have also delved into that at all. Yeah, we have a little bit of study on uh, gastrodermin, but not as extensive as other people. That's a terribly exciting field, as you know. Um, you know, the, the whole family of gastrodermin is regulating different things, including tumor cytal activities. Um, you know, it's relevance for chemotherapy, for gastrodermin E, for example, and in, in roles in uh, making T cells killing gastrodermin E expressing tumor cells. Uh, you have pyroptosis, of course, during uh, immune recognition of pathogens and so forth, and also, you know, forming pores to allow cytokines to be released. So I think that's a very, very, it's probably one of the most exciting developments. And I think it's going to extend way beyond uh, innate immunity, which is what many of these discoveries will, will do. One, so just for our listeners to be aware of the breadth of topics that your lab is working on and a little bit uh, more uh, older work, but from like last year, I was also very interested in, in your work studying the uh, microbes that are protective against damage by radiation, in the, for example, in the case of cancer radiotherapy, and that you found specific uh, bacterial strains that have actually contributed through their metabolism to the protecting patients from the effects of radiation. I was hoping you can just quickly also tell, more, tell us a little bit about that uh, line of research that you have. Yeah, well, this is something that uh, I figure in a podcast may be interesting to share since you asked this question. You know, I had a, a terrible tooth abscess when I was in Poland years ago. And so when I'm there, I don't belong to their national health 
you know, organizations. I couldn't really go see a dentist and stuff like that. So I just ate yogurt for five days. And uh, like morning, night and uh, noon uh, for every meal. And so my tooth abscess was pretty bad. I came home, got that taken care of. And I was sitting in my chair and saying, wait, I had always had GI issues, but it stopped. You know, I was having like five yogurts a day for five days and I don't have any GI issues anymore. And so it was really weird. So then as a scientist, I did an experiment. So I stopped the yogurt, and came back. I restarted myself and I have to replicate the experiment three times. And every time it did what it's supposed to do. So the yogurt in a certain brand of yogurt was really good. So I came into the lab and said, we got to study the microbiome. You know, that was when people were still suspicious of whether it's real or not. And uh, uh, so I found a, you know, quote unquote, a victim, a young graduate student who's just smart and enthusiastic and will, uh, you know, agree to do the project I gave him, which is to look at the microbiome. And it was an extraordinarily challenging project, but Leo has a genomics background. So he ran a, he was a technician for a genomic uh, core before he came to grad school. So all this was, I guess, you know, switching over to microbiome was relatively not as difficult for him as for other people. So he took on this project, Leo Chen, and uh, started profiling microbiome. And to this day, you know, we have, active uh, program going on. And Hao Guo is my postdoc, who's now a research assistant professor, was just radiating mice. And then she noticed that about 10 to 15% of the mice just don't die when you put them under 9.2 gray, which is very high radiation dose, and they live. So she started looking at their microbiome, and that's how this whole story started. You know, so all of us who do radiated mice know that not all the mice die, but we're just going, yeah, you know, what a bad experiment. We couldn't use all the mice, but she actually proceeded to look at those survivors and found out it's their microbiome that was different. So it was a really cool story. And their microbiome was protective of other mice uh, against radiation. So that was the, in the science paper. Yeah, I actually recently published in Nature Communications a protein family that's regulated by the micro that regulates microbiome activity to influence PI3K and AKT activation. Yes. And as a result, uh, loss of it results in protection from uh, ischemia reperfusion radiation because it basically oh, cool. constitutively induces those and so prevents that injury. But they're more susceptible to colitis because it blocks uh, the stem cell regenerative wow. pathways through the same mechanism. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. Now, so what we did is actually we moved, uh, we were worried, you know, you can't just give radiated patients bacteria, obviously, you know, right. probably not a good idea. So we went forward and um, uh, how did a lot of metabolomics with Kunlu's lab, which is a collaborator here at DNC. We're just very lucky to have so many good collaborators. And his post, uh, his student, and we were able to find uh, two different you know, major pathways. One is expected short-chain fatty acid, and the other one is uh, tryptophan metabolites. And we were able to show that both of those can protect against radiation. So we actually just got the IND that we're trying to do some clinical trials with a young uh, fellow uh, to see if some of these metabolites may be helpful for radiated patients who are suffering through adverse effects. And, uh, we have one final question we like to ask people, uh, which is always a fun one. For you, we're going to go with, if you weren't uh, you know, solving the mysteries of NLRPs and macrophages and all things immunology, what hobby would you have picked up that you've always wanted to but couldn't? Oh, yeah. So, you know, when I was in high school, I really liked art. And I actually even won a little contest for designing a Christmas card. And so I would love to do designs and um, maybe do potteries. So I think that would be fun. So it's both of my daughters are very artistic and one actually makes a living as an architect. So clearly she 
you know, did something that relies on her artistic abilities. Um, so, yeah, if I didn't never have to worry about anything, I, I would love to do that. That's awesome. My, my aunt actually does uh, like holiday fancy cards as a side business for fun. Yeah, it was so much fun to design things. But, you know, unfortunately, as a scientist, it's a total commitment. And I don't think I can draw too many things nowadays. So. It's never too late to you know, take it up again. You yeah, I know. still doodle a little bit, but it's like not very good, you know. So thank you very much for, for joining us, for uh, talking to us about your research. And uh, we, well, we wish you uh, lots of luck with the upcoming papers. I'm sure there's a lot in the pipeline of that very uh, ambitious group. Well, thank you very much again. You're very welcome. All thank right. you for the interview. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers and extra reviews of Brenda Science's homework. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at, at immunopodcast or via email at info at immunologypodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. See you next time. <laughs>